Um, so, oh. Sorry, Vasu, I just had to let people know that we're starting to record the meeting. Oh, no worries. Okay. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, delighted actually to see a lot more community members at the meeting, so welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, very excited to kick off our first education series as part of these meetings. So the intent is to create more awareness among the community because climate change can only be solved collectively. So thank you all for joining. Um, so our first part of the agenda is our vision and charge. So if I can share my screen uh, to go over our vision. cooperatively with the town and community to raise climate awareness and achieve results with a sense of urgency. And in everything we do, we will put environmental justice at the forefront of our decisions. And on the right, you see our charge, basically a trimmed down version of our charge. <clears throat> One thing I'll touch on in the charge is what we're talking about today is engaging public and relevant stakeholders in education, planning, goal setting, and development of climate actions. All right. Uh, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. And then the other thing that I also want to touch on is ECAC metrics. So as we go through this meeting today, there will be some progress reports um, by uh, you know some of our ECAC members. Uh, the couple of metrics that I have for myself is increasing our community participation at these meetings. We've had three or less than three participants, um, community uh, folks who uh, join these meetings. My intent is to increase that. And uh, also have uh, this education series as part of these meetings. We've never kind of done this formally and I set myself a goal of 10. So I hope I can hit that. Um, so my expectation for uh, all the other ECAC members is as you're going through your sectors, if you can also send me your information on you know, metrics that you have that you're tracking. That'll be wonderful for the community members to see. Okay, uh, with that, I'll uh, change to talk about the next uh, topic on the agenda is to look at the minutes from the previous meeting. Has everyone had the chance to look at it? Okay. Can someone make a motion to accept or talk about changes? I'll, I'll move we accept the motion, the uh, minutes. I will Thanks. second that. Sorry, writing. Um, so I just need a voice vote. So I'll just call you by the last name. Goldner. Yes. Raghavan. Yes. Gregor. Yes. Allison. Don, I'll come back to you. Selman? Yes. D? Yes. Drucker? Uh, abstain, please. Roof? Yes. Rose? Yes. Allison? Yes. Sorry, I was muted. No worries. Thank you. So minutes are approved. Thanks, Stephanie. And Laurie, I believe it's your turn to take minutes because Stella did last time. Okay. Already on it. Thank you. Okay, let's open up to the public for any comments. So if any member of the public is interested in making a comment, please digitally raise your hand and I will unmute you. And it does not, oh, there's one comment. Uh, Renee, I've unmuted you. You can go ahead and speak. It's just a quick comment. It, it's not really a comment. It's just a request. Um, at the at the end, will, can you inform us of the, the number of participants, sort of the range, you know, the maximum that we have? I'll let, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Renee. All right, it looks like we don't have any other public comments, so let's move on to the next topic, which is progress reports. So this is the last meeting of the month. So Don, do you want to 
uh, walk us through CPACE and then uh, Stella for transportation. Sure. Can um, I, sorry, Don, can I actually go first in case we lose <laughs> lose attention here? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> my partner's in, not By here. By all means, go ahead. <laughs> okay, because we're like on a roll here. Yeah, I understand. You gotta go <laughs> um, If we have to go dark screen and stuff. Uh, anyways, so transport. So I'm catching up on the, the TAC meetings. I prepared Vasu's great slides and those are part of the, the packet. Um, but I figure everybody can kind of read those and I'm not going to go back over them here. Um, but I've been catching up on. Sorry, can we actually show the slides uh, because we do have a lot of. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I do that or should. I don't know how you do. That? I can do that for you if you'd like, Stella. Okay, I have yeah. OK, just but let's go over that, please. Stella. Yeah, we can go over that. One moment, please, and I'll set it up for you. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do the commentary first because I'm just gonna front load the important stuff in case we uh, have to kind of um, go silent. But so so I've been catching up on on TAC meetings, um, and it was actually a lot to think about. It was very depressing. I mean, TAC is doing amazing work. Uh, but the content of what they had to say was pretty depressing in the August meeting because I guess there was a they've been counting um, people who walk and bike to school and it's only like it's under a dozen for both schools um, for at least two of the schools it was like 10 10 kids or so um and the reasons cited were also very depressing because it sounds like it's not that people don't want to it's that really people just like feel very unsafe on the roads um so tac has a lot of you know great amazing very comprehensive in writing thoughts about about crosswalks and bike lanes and things like that but one of the very depressing but also like inspiring things about that is that it just seems like really low hanging fruit because part of that is just speed limits. I mean, like we're out and about with a small child and people just drive like dangerously. And so just like, it seems like, like that's not, that's not really like an infrastructure. Like, I mean, I guess it is kind of a capital expense thing, but it's also just like a changing behavior thing. Um, and the other thing that they said in the TAC meeting that's time sensitive. So I wanted to raise it here is that not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday following. It's on one of the <laughs> slides. <laughs> I put it on one of the slides. Um, <laughs> that it's like National Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day or something. Um, and so TAC is trying to mobilize around that. And so I think it would probably be useful. Like, I'd be happy to reach out to them and but it would be good to just discuss here whether or not there's interest in us jumping in on that to encourage that. Um, okay, so that was the that was the quick update on like hack stuff. I don't know, Vasu, how we should if that should just be a casual discussion or if that should be like people email Stephanie if they're interested in helping jump in on the TAC thing and then we get in touch with TAC, like open meeting law and stuff. Yeah, I guess the question is how are we, how is TAC creating awareness around this campaign? Yeah, that and that I don't really know um, because that I I don't, I don't know. Um, that I think that would require getting in touch with them directly. Um, I think it was kind of like us at the, at the, um, block party where hmm. you know so okay steve yeah this looks great um the first or second point on the first slide it's um a lot of people individually driving to work and, and this needs to change i agree um that's something that the larger employers kind of need to take the lead on um perhaps ah. encouraged by tac and ECAC in the town is, do you know if TAC has tried to work with the big employers in town to encourage car? I don't. So this is where I, my, my sense of TAC right now is that they've mostly been focused on bike and pedestrian. Um, but again, I'm still catching up on their meetings. So that, that could be wrong. 
but no i totally agree that that's a the that requires partnering with big employers um i mean obviously the town is also an employer yeah. uh so to that extent i think we can we can play a role i also think um so this gets into that gets into point three. What can we do? Okay, so I'll go over the slide slides now. This is a good good transition. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about transportation, which is decarbonizing town transit and supporting active transit, non-vehicular transit? Um, well, I don't know. Are bikes technically vehicles? I'm not like enough of a transit person to know that, but uh it's important because according to the carp transport accounts for over a fifth of our greenhouse gas emissions um i i looked at some of the slides from the presentation later and it, i i wonder if that number is low or how that accounting was done but either way it's pretty high um what can we do about this at ecac as ecac is partner with the transportation advisory committee uh on active transport and other stuff but my sense right now like i said is that the focus thing on active transport um research and encourage electrification and modification of the town vehicular fleet this could also be just like something as simple as as scheduling i think we could play a role in like for example we were at the playground yesterday and they were mowing but the grass was like fine so like so like I, there's probably like a fixed rotation, I would imagine, um, you know, that if like one piece of piece of lawn falls behind, then another piece of lawn falls behind, but just like auditing, maybe auditing stuff like that is something we could play a role in. Uh, educating the public with respect to the need for reduction motor, motor vehicle use overall, vehicle electrification when vehicles are necessary. <laughs> Um, and also vehicle downsizing, which I've talked about before. Uh, I think you see this a lot in the commercial sector and also in the civilian sector where people are just driving larger vehicles than they really need for the job. Uh, what can we not do as ECAC is single-handedly overhaul town infrastructure, fund the switch to electric vehicles, or like force people to do stuff. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, what partnerships can we and do we need to have? I think it would be useful to build a closer relationship with TAC, um, partner with the universities. This gets to Steve's point about big employers, uh, work with businesses to downsize and electrify their vehicles. And also, also this gets to Steve's really amazing vehicle electrification oh. document is partnering with, with larger landlords uh and such um leading and lagging indicators correct me if any of these are wrong because leading and lagging indicators was new terminology for me but i do think the number of children walking or biking to school is a really good indicator my my friend who i've talked about before who's a transit professional loves watching that show from japan old enough I don't know if anybody has heard about this, where like two-year-olds go out and do errands uh, like alone. They're obviously not alone because there's a camera crew, um, but it's apparently really cute and a really interesting study in infrastructure that's designed for people. I think like I think like if if kids feel safe on the road and parents feel safe with kids on on sidewalks independently, that's a good sign that things are moving in the right direction. And then also indicators, number of the town, like the amount, percentage of the town fleet that's electric and um, infrastructure, reduced speed limits. Uh, then the funding piece that gets to that report that Laura sent me on the Infrastructure Act and that whole long list of grants. Um, so there are many grant options, some of which we're eligible for and some of which it sounds like we're not uh next slide please hey, hey Stella on this slide sorry um oh yeah so you're you're saying you're going to measure this leading indicator increased number of children and TAC is trying to measure that and then in terms of reducing pedestrian deaths I think it's tricky there if you increase the number of children walking 
to bike uh, to school, then the probability of accident increases as well. So we might want to be careful there because there's a, a you know potential effect because more people are walking. Uh, that you can just, I guess, be more mindful when you're tracking that indicator. Yeah, I think that's true. I think pedestrian deaths should be zero, point blank. You know, yeah. like anything, like anything above zero in that department is something that we as a society like currently tolerate that we should just have zero tolerance for. You know, so I I think like that combo that makes that combo powerful, right? Because we need more people and we need it to be safe for those people. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be death; it could be accidents too. So yeah, totally. And then my other um sorry, what, what was your other question? Vasu, you're frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, right, there's there are cars that people can purchase that are discounted where there's, there are some cars that if you manufacture it outside the United States, you don't have that discount. So I think maybe somehow capturing that for the community, I think is important. Um, and I know there's also a website that I sent you a link to and somehow pulling that information and sharing that with everybody would be useful. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Laura? Yeah, just to comment on the school, walking and biking to school, which of course I think is an important um, indicator. I don't think that's actually the best way to address GHG emissions associated with school. I think to do that, we need to electrify the bus fleet um, because walking and biking to school for children that are close to school, I think, it's always an option for children that are not close to school. I think it will be an option only some of the time. I also think it's sort of potentially is challenging for people who work full-time schedules. Um, so, you know, just throwing that out there. No, I think that's true. And I totally agree. The reason I put that and not, not electrifying buses is I feel like, like, electrifying buses is very much like in the discourse already like people are like very like the there was a lot of enthusiasm for like electrifying the bus fleet you know what I mean like I feel like there's like I see more momentum on that right now um yeah I would just I would just say that there's momentum for one-off <laughs> bus fleet electrification when it's in the news and what I think we should be pushing for is a plan for how we're going to electrify all the buses over time um, from the school and the town. Yeah. I haven't no, seen I think, that. I think yeah. that's true. Um, yeah. Could, uh, could, 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 I, could I ask, Stella, is it your sense that the TAC is looking at bus electrification or is that not in their focus? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Duane? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I guess two things. One is uh, maybe I'm naive, but my guess is that <clears throat> um, electric buses will be the natural market in, in 10 years or so. Um, and that's not to suggest we shouldn't be first movers and, and push the envelope and, and help move that <sighs> market forward. Um, but um, they're just going to be better buses, um, I think, in, in 10 years uh, and, and, and of, of, of buses of choice. But what I wanted to actually say was that in my, uh, um, uh, my, my own pet peeve with regard to students and transportation, um, and this is more maybe at the high school level, is that once, and I'm just um, reporting on my own experience with my older son at least <laughs> one once they learn how to drive they don't want to take the bus um and so this is a subset of the population um of the student population but 
uh, as much as I could try in, in, in all my background, convince my son to not drive to work because it's better to take the bus, he wouldn't hear of it. Uh, so um, I, I don't, under, I, in my mind, I don't, you know, if the school could just, you know, not provide parking <laughs> for students without special permission, that would help uh, relieve that problem. Yeah, Dwayne, I love that idea because I think like, and this is kind of what I was trying to get at with the the pedestrian. Like, I think I think we need to we do need to kind of have a, a degrowth mindset, right? Like, we're not just trying to switch everything to electric. Like, we actually also need to be using less energy. Um, and so, I think that I think that would be great trying to increase bus ridership and and decrease uh, high schoolers driving. Um, <laughs> And the more indicators we have for those things that like that like mindsets are actually like shifting as opposed to like purchasing habits, uh, I think that's really important. And, and, uh, sorry, Steve, go ahead. <laughs> that just I was thinking it's really hard to convince people who are already working commuting to and from their jobs to. I We've been trying that for decades and it's very sort of limited success. Um, but Dwayne's mentioning of the high school, maybe that's a place to start somehow encouraging carpooling. And maybe you only get to be able to park at the high school if you're a student, if you're officially carpooling. So maybe there's a carpool program that could be dreamed up that would apply to those early drivers who are developing their habits that hopefully would carry longer into their lives. Well, yeah, so this was another thing that TAC was talking about, about the effects of COVID on bus ridership, yeah. because not only is like, like walking and biking and rolling to school very low, but bus ridership went way down, like, for reasons that like, of course, make sense during the pandemic. And, um, and so now you just have tons of people, it sounds like at all of the schools just driving to school. Jesse? And then Laura. You're mute, Jesse. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate that I think that the relevance of that approach with the high school students, I'm looking for the statistic now, but my understanding is that a, the majority of driving in this country is trips of three miles or less. It's a, it's, it's a surprisingly high amount of the gas that gets used. And I think this is the students, the argument would be, oh, well, it's not a long commute. They all live right in Amherst. Well, turns out that's a lot of the driving that happens and that hitting people young with these concepts would be um, powerful and relevant. So just reaffirming that idea. Laura? Yeah, just final point here. Um, Thanks, Stella. This has been really great. Um, appreciate you following following this. Um, somebody, I saw something probably on Twitter or something the other day that was like, if your solution is if just everybody did X, then that's not a good solution because <laughs> there's never been a time where we've just been able to make everybody do something. So it's like that was coming to my mind when we were talking about that this is like and everything we need to focus on needs to be multi-pronged, right? We need to encourage more walking, less driving, electric buses, all of that stuff. Um, the only thing I, I would say, Stella, is that I think potentially another reason why bus ridership is down is because they've changed the bus routes and have um, put a lot of the bus routes in what I would consider unsafe locations for picking kids up. Um, but it, all that to say is that I think a larger conversation with the folks at the school that deal with all things relevant to the buses might be helpful. I'm not sure if that's something ECAC should do or whether that's something that TAC or someone else should do, but just think there's opportunity there to kind of work together. Yeah, and one thing that I have uh, that I was thinking about is whether, you know, we all pay vehicle tax. Is that data that's available, you know, the cars that people are driving on the road, is that a data that we can get and see whether that's increasing or changing to electric? Can we, you know, analyze that data? Um, 
And it's a question for Stephanie to see if that data can be available, made available to TAC or Stella. Sorry, can you rephrase that question, Vasu? I wasn't totally, I'm writing, but not following. Yeah, you. no, we pay vehicle tax every year. Uh, you know, it talks, it has information on uh, the year and the, your brand of car. I just wonder if we can pull all that information to see how many vehicles do we have in town and the type of cars that we drive. Can we analyze that data? We might be able to get aggregate data. Uh, we couldn't get obviously individual data, but we might sure. be able to get aggregate data. I know that because we've looked at that before when we've been doing the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. That's one of the metrics we look at. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you some information, but not everything you need. So, uh, but we can certainly find out if we can get that. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if that could be made into a leading indicator potentially or lagging indicator depending on what we think about um stella so something to think about for you as well yeah for sure um should we do the next slide i i just sorry i couldn't find my i raised my hand but not electronically because i couldn't find it quick enough but um i just thought i'd add to that i mean another way to sort of track um um the, hopefully the increase in electric vehicle um, usage in town is to um, track the metrics on the electric recharging stations in town. Um, I know UMass does this on a periodic basis, um, but obviously there's other recharging stations in town and, um, and there's a robust data set. Um, uh, charge point is, is, is the predominant um vendor of the of those that equipment i don't know how open and in what at what level um that data can be provided but uh perhaps it can be provided just in terms of the amount of uh, uh electricity or or hours of of charging um over time as a as a way to track um electric vehicle use usage yeah thanks Ray. Stephanie, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so how will we implement it? Research, advocacy, I mean, the same as we do all of our stuff. Uh, and how will we educate the... Okay, I have some, some bad... No, I don't. You don't want to sit on the party? Yeah. Okay, well, it sounds like maybe you do. I think I'm going to have to bail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but this. Watch a video. Okay. Um, but this is this is the slide. There's two more slides, but they basically have the information that I mentioned before about about TAC um, and the walk bike world of school day that they're working on coming up. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, this is great. I, I think this is a great start. Definitely a lot to think about based on feedback that you received from uh, the other members. So um, for the next meeting and working with tech, if you can continue to finalize this and let us know what help you need, that would be excellent. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I'll keep listening. This I might okay. have to turn off video. No worries. All right, uh, the next part of the agenda is uh, CPACE, and then we'll talk about the education. Um, so Don and uh, Stephanie, if you wanna share Don's slide. Sure, I'll go through it fairly quickly. Um, I, I do, I, I do as, a, as a initial matter, wanna apologize because I literally left for Europe um, about four or five days after our last meeting and got back um, very, very late Monday night. Um, so I did reach out to both BID and the chamber before I left, did not get a response, um, and we'll be reaching out to them again this week. Um, but in any event, let's just go through the slides and we can talk a little bit about what I see are the difficulties um, with the program. Um, but in any event, um, what is the program? It's a statutory financing program adopted by the Commonwealth that authorizes local governments to 
incentivize owners of existing commercial, industrial, and multifamily residential properties to undertake decarbonization improvements, both renewable and efficiency improvements. I think the key things in that is it, it, it applies to existing properties, um, not new construction. Um, I think the issues that arise um, have to do with, uh, I, th I think it's an easier hill to climb if, if, if there's a new buyer or developer purchasing a property and who intends to do renovations on that property at the time of the purchase to incentivize them to look at the program. I think it's a harder sell um, economically to, uh, to incentivize existing landowners or property owners who, who, who don't really intend right now to do any sort of retrofitting or work that costs money to incentivize them to do it anyway, to, to spend the money to you know, do some retrofitting, particularly in existing residential, um, you know, multifamily, five family residential properties. So I, I think some of the difficulties with the program, and, and we heard from the individual from Greenfield, I mean, they, they've had one project. Uh, we, we haven't had any, and, and I, didn't, I didn't even find out, and Stephanie, you probably know, whether or not Amherst has actually authorized PACE. Do, do we know, have they authorized it? The town yes, we have. Okay. We have. It's already, yes, it's been approved. We just, at this point, we're really needing to promote it. Yeah, so that, that becomes the issue. Um, and I think the real issue is how do we publicize the commercial and communal benefits? And I mean communal as a community benefits of the program um, and educate and encourage property owner participation. And I, I, the only way to do that is by facilitating the dissemination of information about the program and the availability of the program. I don't know how we go about, I mean, and I, boy, I would welcome any sort of input in how to incentivize existing owners, particularly of multifamily residential properties, to undertake these decarbonization improvements. Um, be, because no matter how you cut it, it is a loan. You are borrowing money in this program and you do have to pay the money back. Um, so there's a, you know, there's that economic hurdle to overcome. Yeah. Um, and boy, do I welcome any suggestions on how we overcome what I see as a significant economic hurdle. So if you want to Steve, go to the next slide, Stephanie, if there's no questions. Uh, I see Steve, go ahead. Well, I wonder, it sounds, Don, like maybe this just isn't an attractive enough program, but do you know or can we find out what property owners in town have been doing or might be doing interested in renovations and whether they would have used CPACE if they had known about it? And if not, why not? Maybe we can learn how they are financing um, even if they aren't using CPACE. So perhaps some kind of a survey of the property owners with, with that affiliated with the larger residential housing properties um, might be a way to get some answers and point in some directions that could be productive. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I agree with you, Steve. You know, to the extent that the landowner does want to do renovations, um, then we don't have the economic hurdle that I was talking about before of, of trying to incentivize people who, you know, don't think they need to spend the money right now. They, you know, renovations are not on their front burner for them. Um, and, that, and that may make a lot of sense. If, if there is a way we can, we can get that information. Laurie, and then Dwayne. 
So it occurs to me that the time when anyone is most likely to want to make use of these programs is when a heating system needs to be replaced anyway, for example. So when that happens, presumably one needs some sort of a permit. Um, can we get information at that point? Is there a way for us to distribute information when people come to the point where they're trying to make a renovation? Is there any point at which the town has interaction where advertising CPAs could be useful? We discussed this a little bit last time, but yeah, I, I don't I, think we talked about this particularly. Well, I think I think the real issue, and <clears throat> and this is something that you know Jesse and I both talked about last time. The, the real issue is that by the time somebody is coming to pull a permit. Uh, right, right. They've uh -huh. already gotten, you know, they, they've got their contractor, they know what they're going to put in there, you know, and in fact, it's the right. contractor who pulls the permit um, to do whatever work he or she has been contracted to do. I mean, the idea is to get the information to people somehow, you know, before they are making their decisions. Okay, so um, then so then the other place that this information comes to consumers is through, you know, as someone who now has half a dozen, no, more like 12 uh, quotes for, my, for work to be done on my own house, um, every one of them comes with a little star at the bottom that says so much of this is eligible for a mass save rebate. Um, are contractors doing the same thing when they're asked to do these larger jobs? Do they know about it? You'd think that that would be another place where there are only a limited number of contractors in the area. Maybe we can advertise to them. Maybe they already know about it. Maybe they're who should we, we who, who we should be um, approaching rather than the building owners. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a, a good suggestion. I mean, I I just know like your experience from our experience because we're in the process of putting geothermal in in our in our house. You know, we call up the contractor. You know who gives us a whole list of what um, they need to purchase and what the available programs are for uh, ED&I to, to, to take advantage of, whether it be a, a tax credit or a payment um, uh, directly from Mass Save or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot, I don't know I mean, I, I do know that that's where for a lot of individual residences, that's the process they go through. I'm not sure that's a process a developer goes through who's trying to do um, a, a rehabilitation of a large commercial or a large multifamily residential process. But I tell you, those 0% loans are looking better and better all the time right now, huh? Yeah. Uh, Dwayne and then Stephanie. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, and I, I like uh, um, Lori's suggestion, particularly about working with the uh, or informing the contractors that oh, this is something you can offer to your clients of a of a incentivized uh, loan program. But what I wa also was going to um, put out there just as a suggestion um, is that you know to the extent that we are in tandem, and I, I don't know exactly the status of this, but sort of working or thinking about working towards a energy labeling uh, uh, type of, of program where um, buildings commercial, and, and I'm thinking particularly of the res, uh, multifamily residential buildings uh, would need to disclose some information about their energy use. Um, that would also be an opportunity to say, oh, and by the way, if you wanna um, have a, if you wanna turn and you know, develop a good label for yourself, uh, and it'll be publicly available and part of your marketing. Here's a CPACE program you can tap into um, to, uh, to get your energy costs down. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, I don't know if, the, if, you know, when I was doing a lot of thinking about this, I, I've been thinking about projects that had this program been available um, might ve very well have been you know, ideal projects for something like this when, you know, the, the cinema was all done and, and redone, when the old Shawmut Bank building was redone. Um, I just don't know what, I mean, looking at the commercial end, what, is there anything kind of on the horizon, any sort of, you know, purchase and, 
um, and renovation of existing commercial buildings. I, I just I just wasn't aware of any, and I don't know of any. Um, yeah. Stephanie, Andra, and Jesse. You're on mute, Stephanie. I just pressed it like three times, sorry. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say to sort of backtrack a little bit about um, the permitting process is that, you know, we have contractors um, coming into town hall all the time. And one of the things that I think is just a basic thing that we need to have is some kind of flyer, digital and physical, that's available on the second floor and maybe even on the first floor. Um, that has information about the CPACE program. Uh, I think that's just like a basic first step is just, you know, even just the marketing of getting the information out. And I think it's something that, especially if it's digital, that we could probably have on the page, you know, pages, links on the town's website that have the, has the permitting information, you know, that there could be some information or a link about CPACE, you know, the CPACE program. So I think that's something that we could do at least as a presence on the town website that would help at least get the information out there. And I don't personally know of any big projects that are on the horizon, but you know, typically there are always discussions even before permits are pulled where contractors, building owners come in, developers come in early in the process to meet with planning staff to discuss potential projects to sort of get a get some direction as to their their permits that they need and what they should be doing. So, you know, again, having the information for staff to distribute would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm happy to talk with you, Stephanie, about putting together some sort of two paragraph or some sort of so, some sort of summary of the program and 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 how it works um, to include in, in that information when when people come in to inquire about the permitting process in Amherst? I'd be happy to work on that with you, Don. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to you because I, 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 I've spent enough time looking at the program now that I could certainly um, put together a, um, a, a summary that would, and, and provide links as, as, as I did here in these slides to the, you know both the statute and and fact sheets that uh, that the state and uh, and that the feds put out. So, um, as next, right? <laughs> yes, go ahead, Andrew. Um, so I'm aware that we haven't gone through your slides, um, <laughs> and I don't know if some of what we're talking about is on your slides, um, but it seems to me we need some basic information. Um, how many um, buildings do we have that are you know, likely to be potential targets, you know, should, should some um, rehab be, be done? Um, this is, a, a basic question. I, I think it's no longer C pace, it's pace, and that it's available generally, but that there's other financing sources that might be more beneficial to um, homeowners, you know, small building owners. Um, but do you know the answer to that? Um, the authorizing legislation is CPACE. The, 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 the terminology that Massachusetts uses is, is mass pace. But if you actually read the statute, the Massachusetts statute, it's still CPACE. They just, they've just dropped the C in the vernacular. But, but does that mean that um, it's not only for commercial. Is that no. why it was dropped, or is it actually not for homeowners? 
it's not for homeowners. It's for mo it's it's for the it's for commercial, industrial, and multifamily five unit um, okay. properties. Okay. So um, yeah, I think we should know what properties we're talking about, and you know how many uh, owners are there, and yeah, I think information is would be a really good thing to start with. And I suppose we could get that from the assessor's office. I don't know how how, how we would go about compiling the list of properties that would meet the criteria of being commercial, industrial, or multifamily, more than five units. So Don, I, I wanna be mindful of time as well. So let's try to wrap this up in 10 minutes and then get to the education series. But uh, I, I think these are all great questions. Um, Stephanie, you might have the answer to the question that Andre raised and um, do you wanna quickly jump in and answer? Yeah, I will say with that, you know, I think this goes to compiling information like we were trying to do um, for the um, building energy rating system. It's not an easy way to just get data. <laughs> it seems like it should be very straightforward, but it hasn't been. But we can certainly try to run some reports and we can get we can certainly get an idea, but we may not have like exact numbers and we might not be able to gather some of the data that we really want to get, but we can do our best and work with what we have. Jesse, go ahead. So I, I, I do think circling back to this idea of how, how to get this information about this program out to people who are decision makers and who could employ the program, it's a very good idea. Um, since it's commercial, it does require any commercial construction in Massachusetts, requires construction control. So you're going to need a design professional and a design team. And particularly in the scale of project that we saw at the presentation, this, they didn't think, they thought it was hard to make the numbers work on the really small projects. Um, therefore, I think getting this information, not maybe not to builders or not only builders, um, but not general contractors as much as potentially um, MEP contractors that do design build, as well as architects. So Western Mass AIA might be another target audience if you're putting together a couple paragraphs um, and all the local developers. Like again, I think any energy work on a on a building is should and, and be somewhat holistic and not just one part of a project that comes in at the end. It, it's going to work much better if it's integrated into the design. Um, so the earlier it hits that this information hits the design team, the better. Um, and then there's another track, which may be what Lori brought up before is the repair, a new roof, a new boiler that becomes an insulated roof or um, something that could be served by renewables. So I think, which may not involve an architect or a full design team, maybe like, as I mentioned before, it's more of a design build. So. That's my quick comments. Thanks, Jesse. You know, I mean, to me, that's the fundamental issue is how do we get the information to the right people who will be involved at an early enough stage in the project so as to, you know, it has to increase the possibility that they would elect to use this program and to um, and to install in their in their uh, project um, decarbonization processes. So, yeah, definitely some of the leading indicators, right? These are things that we can do now, depending on what they are, right? I think we're still trying to figure out what it is, but they could be leading indicators for us. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the, the slides are available to everybody. We don't need, I mean, I, the time is running short. We don't need to go through them anymore um, unless you want me to, I don't really care. But we have 10 more minutes and then we can, we can jump to education. 
Okay. But I, I, there's not really much else to say. You can put on the next slide, but. I have a request. Yeah. That the next time we do this education series, I think this is a great idea, but I would like to know what time we're aiming for the education yeah. part to start. Cause I wasn't sure what to tell people for this meeting. And I think, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thanks Lori. I was just thinking about it as well. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, in addition to what you all just added, we can build relationships with BID and the chamber to educate property owners and encourage participation. They're really, from our perspective, there's really, there are minimal costs associated with uh, preparing flyers or information that encourage participation. Um, so, so the funding issue doesn't seem to be an issue that would impact um, what we do or what we're able to do. Next. <laughs> Again, like just like Stella before me, how do we implement it? You know, research, advocacy, educational events, and by educational events, it includes educational materials, not just events, but the dissemination of materials, which I should add to that. Um, we talked about how we can educate the community um, to disseminate information. Um, for me, the key milestone would be a first successful project, just like Greenfield had. Um, to me, that's, that's the initial hump to get over. Just get a first successful project. And I see a couple of hands up. So, uh, Yeah, Steve, uh, I think, Jesse, you just need to lower your hand. Yeah, okay. Steve? Yeah, I was just sort of musing on this. Um, I had great hopes that CPACE would be really attractive to developers and then it all jump in line to take advantage of it. Um, and perhaps it's a little sad if that's not the case. Still, I think our goal, our bigger goal, the big goal is to get more of our buildings renovated. Mm -hmm. And so if, if perhaps CPACE isn't the greatest tool for it, maybe we move on and try to find ways that can help encourage particularly the owners of the bigger buildings, um, find out how you know, what it would take to get them to think of, go from thinking about doing an energy efficiency retrofit to actually doing one. What are the stumbling blocks that they see and how to help reduce those stumbling blocks? And it may be finding somebody somewhere who has done one of these projects, a builder or an owner or contractor talking to owners and builders and contractors who are thinking about it. So get that peer-to-peer -peer experience. If, if perhaps we can facilitate that kind of meeting or forum, that might be really valuable. Uh, and I agree, Steve. I mean, I think that, that went to the kind of dichotomy that I presented in the beginning. If we can get existing people, yeah. existing owners to embark upon renovation that they might otherwise not be embarking upon, then this program is attractive for a, for a number of reasons, but it's getting them over that hump to say, hey, this is a good thing to do. Um, and, and there's this program that, that once you decide to do it, could, could really make it easier than it might not otherwise be. Yeah, Don, maybe another action would be to, you know, talk to somebody in the state to figure out who, which town has implemented PACE and what can we learn from them? Is that something that, you know, oh, Laura, you had something to say. Go ahead. The, the list, that list is right on the PACE homepage. There yeah. is a oh, list is. Okay. That, we should, yeah. that we should yeah. use. You, we were talking about a brochure before where there is a link to their homepage. I mean, it's hard to deconvolve all the different programs, but their homepage mm -hmm. is actually pretty concise and nice. And our town, Amherst, is listed right up there with about 30 other towns that have already permitted CPACE, have already mm -hmm. authorized it. Yeah, I mean, that's just the authorization, though, that, that, that yeah. is not a list of any projects. It's right. just towns that have bought into, um, done the done the authorization that the statute that the statute requires the town to do. I don't know how we would get a list 
without calling various, I mean, you could go down the list of towns that have adopted the program and call okay. somebody in the town and say, hey, have you had any projects and how did you go about doing it? I'm sure somebody at CPACE knows. I mean, there are phone numbers you can right. call and just ask. Yeah. Uh, Andra and then Stephanie. So one thing that I'd like for us to keep at the forefront of our minds, as our vision says we will, is the equity implications, and especially for the multifamily. Um, I believe in the latest uh, legislation, there were some aspects of you know, redoing mass save in a way that would make it harder for people to be displaced. <laughs> um, this is a really critical piece. We want the buildings to be retrofitted. They will be more um, attractive buildings, you know, in terms of their functionality, um, their health, their um, energy efficiency. And we don't want people to be pushed out. So this is going to be something that I think we can learn from other places where this has been done more. Um, and just, you know, let's make that our, a part of our um, milestones and, and an important piece of, of measuring our success. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. And I think it's important to continue to remind us about it. Thank you. Stephanie? Um, so I was just going to say that, um, you know, we have a contact for the CPACE program when we were uh, applying and I could reach out and see if they, because they'll know, I mean, if there are communities that have implemented this and actually, you know, implemented uh, projects, they're going to be aware. So I can ask them about that, but then also I'm wondering about even asking them to maybe be one of your educational series presenters, because it seems to me that there are so many questions about this. And I don't think Amherst is really unique in having challenges with this program and implementing this program. So, you know, I wonder if you made this one of the educational series topics that you might actually even be able to get some other communities interested in attending and watching and submitting questions ahead of time. So that might be. Okay. I love the idea, Stephanie. I mean, I think this is the biggest contributor to our emissions, and I, yeah, six point whatever five percent. So yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for taking that on. A couple more slides, John, but we have two minutes. Anything you want to cover? Actually, one minute now. I, I'm not sure there's anything else to cover. You can go through the slides if you want. I mean, I've given you, you know just some of the things I think about, I'm going to have to redo all this stuff because you guys, you all have had some really good ideas. Um, but, and in the previous slide, I've indicated, you, you know, the websites that can give you kind of basic fact sheets. And, and if anybody is wants to be bored and read the statute, that's in there too. Um, so that's good. That's really all for me. Thanks, John. This is a lot of work. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, let's make sure you're not working in silo. You have support from Laura and the rest of us as well. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, well this is a lot of work. I appreciate everybody's input because like Steve says, I, you know, to me, the biggest thing is, and, and, and what Andra's talking about, the biggest thing is encouraging getting residential property owners, uh, multifamily property owners to undertake these projects, to, to shell out money um, because it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, that's, that to me is the mountain to yeah. get over. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm excited to introduce you all to Dr. Martha Hanner. Uh, Professor Hanner spent 25 years in the Jet Propulsion Lab working on NASA missions, 
to planets and comets in the solar system. So she probably knows more about the atmosphere on other planets than I do about the Earth. So uh, welcome, Martha. And um, uh, so during this part of the meeting, we will pause in the middle of uh, the slide. I think it's slide 13 or 14 for questions after uh, we go over the overview of the state decarbonization plan. So we'll open up to, uh, to the public for questions. And then we'll open it up again for questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, also, please remember that this is a safe space and there is no wrong question, no judgment. So we encourage all of you to bring up questions, whatever they are. Um, we're all learning uh, together in this journey. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Martha. Great. Thank you, Varsu. Let me try to share my screen here. Let's see. And slideshow. There. Okay, try to move this over. All right. Well, thank you. This is basically a talk that I gave to the Solar Bylaw Working Group a month ago. And so I, first a disclaimer, I am a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but I speak as an individual today. And so anything I say or any views that I present are just mine and not representative of anyone else on the Solar Bylaw Working Group. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is give a high level overview of the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization, whoops, excuse me, roadmap published in December, 2020. And then I'll discuss the updates and the near-term goals of the clean energy and climate plan for 2025 and 2030 that was just released a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in January, 2020, Governor Baker committed Massachusetts to an aggressive target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And in the fine print, what that really meant was at least a minimum of an 85% reduction from 1990, which is considered now the, the baseline level. Mm -hmm. But the important point is that net zero means that any residual emissions uh, do not exceed the amount that's removed from the atmosphere each year. No, there's going to be some small amount of residual emissions, no matter what we do, probably. And so you've got to balance the equation. You know, any emissions that you put in have to be balanced by whatever it is you draw down, whatever carbon sequestration you have. And that uh, really today means natural forests, wetlands, and so on. <laughs> so the roadmap was supported by several technical studies. <laughs> the top one, the energy pathways to deep decarbonization was the most basic, giving strategies for conversion to renewable energy to answer the basic question, is net zero by 2050 feasible? And is it feasible at some reasonable cost that leaves Massachusetts with a thriving economy? <laughs> so I'll discuss that report along with the roadmap and the 2022 update. So the three red dots here are what I'll discuss. And you note that there were other technical reports uh, emphasizing the various sectors of transportation, buildings, and so on. <laughs> So first, let's have a look at the greenhouse gas emissions for Massachusetts. And you can see that transportation is by far the highest for Massachusetts as a whole. Uh, this plot from 2005 to 2017 here. After that comes buildings, and both of those have remained fairly constant over the past couple of decades. Transportation, I think, has decreased somewhat as emission controls have Im improved in automobiles. And then you look at the electricity plot there, and the emissions from the electricity sector have decreased by about 50%. Mm -hmm. And that is because the coal-fired plants have been closed and the oil-fired power plants have, have been closed. Mainly the electricity now comes from natural gas plants, which are still fossil fuels, but have smaller uh, CO2 emissions per kilogram generated. Mm -hmm. But I stress that the electricity use has not decreased 
it's probably in fact increased, but it's just that the emission controls have uh, really made progress. <laughs> so just to summarize again, then we have the transportation sector, buildings, the electricity generation, and then some residual industrial and other non-energy uh, parts. And then, so each sector really has to be tackled individually and uh, congratulations to all of you because that's what you're digging in to do here based on your reports that you've just given. So, uh, so then what are the strategies for decarbonization here? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all is increasing energy efficiency and that is really uh, Im important because there's no downside to that. You know, anything you do that helps reduce your energy use and increase in efficiency has, has no negative side effects and so on. <laughs> then you have to electrify all the end use technologies. That means electrify the transportation system, starting with the public transportation of buses, trains. The report even talks about airplanes and so on. Uh, and then also for the building sector, which now is mainly using fossil fuels for heating to electrify with, with heat pumps or geothermal solar panels and so on. And then once you've electrified things, now you have to really focus on decarbonizing the electricity generation. And you can't ignore the carbon capture side because you still have to balance the equation of drawing down as much as possible in order to mitigate the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we have then from this report, the four pillars of decarbonization, starting from the left here, the end use energy, that means really electrifying uh, vehicles. And I really would foresee some technology improvements coming in the years, say for passenger vehicles, uh, lighter weight batteries per perhaps, um, and maybe solar panels on the roof of every car to really decrease the uh, draw on the energy. Uh, for energy efficiency and flexibility, they focus mainly then on the buildings, uh, as you folks have already been discussing here, we really need to aggressively pursue the energy efficiency, both for residential and commercial buildings. And that would mean installing a lot of rooftop solar uh, and heat pumps, and again, improving the efficiency. Decarbonization means switching to wind energy in particular and solar panels, uh, hydroelectric, um, and the report talks about actually trying to decarbonize uh, natural gas so that you have a supply of almost emission-free fuel to use for power plants. And finally then, the, uh, the sequestration of carbon to balance again, you need to uh, really make an effort to protect uh, wetlands, forests, and so on, and try as much as possible to increase the amount of sequestration. <laughs> so this technical report then considered eight different energy pathways where they uh, did an analysis in order to ascertain what's the reliability of a particular pathway, what's the costs and so on, and does it really lead to the goal we want? So the first one was considering all possible options, and this was really their baseline. And the conclusion would be that there really is possible to have deep decarbonization um, and uh, with a reasonable cost. Then uh, they started in by uh, you know, varying one parameter at a time in the different pathways, one being if you limit offshore wind, what happens? And then you are really stressed trying to come up with sufficient clean energy resources. And uh, the report concluded that really uh, installing some new modern small nuclear reactors for power would be helpful in that particular case. If you limited efficiency here, then 
they conclude that costs would indeed increase significantly and you'd have a larger demand that you would have to be satisfying for, for energy. Mm -hmm. The pipeline gas, this was again being, uh, if, you, if you needed to continue relying on natural gas, Again, they talk about trying to improve the technology so that you could somehow decarbonize the gas at, so that it would have a very low emissions. Let's see, get to the next slide here. There we go. Um, and then if you have 100% renewable uh, primary energy so that no fossil fuels are permitted at all, then you do have a challenge trying to um, get to sufficient energy in, in 2050 from wind, solar, and, and so on. You have a hard time balancing the fluctuations and there would be a large increase in cost. Um, and then if you have no thermal, you'd have substantially higher reliance on solar power, particularly ground mounted and again challenges to to uh, to balance the uh, the use uh, regional coordination was considered a plus uh, Massachusetts is part of the regional grid and finally the bottom one called distributed energy resources breakthrough and that is a, a study of what are, happens if you can deploy, a lot more solar in particular be behind the meter, so to speak. And I'll talk about more about that in the in the minute. If you could really drastically increase that amount, you would indeed be able to um, uh, get a, be a better um, result and decrease your need for ground mounted solar. <laughs> So Massachusetts is part of the Northeast Regional Electric Grid, and that consists of New England, adjacent areas of New York, and adjacent Southern Canada. And all of the entities have committed to reduction targets of at least 80%. Mm -hmm. Other characteristics here are we have a high population density, which makes it challenging to site the resources. We have large winter heating loads, large offshore wind potential. The south of Cape Cod, we really have a world-class wind field. And this is really um, something that we're state is trying to take advantage of. Contracts are already underway and hopefully with more to come. We have moderate solar resource quality. After all, we are at 42 degrees latitude. And you know we have a fair amount of rain and snow, but still we do have uh, ability to have significant solar energy. And we have the tie-in with the Canadian hydroelectric system, Hydro-Quebec, although the challenge is to get the transmission lines across New Hampshire or Maine down from Quebec to Massachusetts. And here in New England, there's no significant geological sequestration potential. <laughs> so then what was the result of their model calculations? They concluded that offshore wind really is going to be the most important aspect of a decarbonized electric system. And if offshore wind is limited, then the hydro Quebec becomes a lot more important and we need would need to import more electricity and also then uh, perhaps institute some new nuclear power generation. Mm -hmm. Solar photovoltaics made up 25 to 30% of the electricity generation across most pathways. And the challenge being the cost of trying to store it and shifting from when it, the sun is up till nighttime when you need the power. <laughs> and rooftop and ground mounted solar were both needed, but the more that you could develop the rooftop parking lot, et cetera, 
solar deployment, then you could significantly reduce the amount of land that would be required. Mm -hmm. And they conclude that the share of final energy delivered as electricity would be approximately 68% in 2050, which would be about a factor of three and a half higher than the 2020 levels. Yes. <clears throat> so behind the meter, uh, that means energy production and storage, uh, particularly the solar photovoltaics that directly supply homes and buildings with electricity before passing through the meter. And one strong advantage is you have point of use generation. You don't need the whole transmission grid. Mm -hmm. It's a distributed system and can still be tied into the grid, but it reduces energy dependence. And depending on the setup, it could in fact be independent so that if the grid goes down and ice storms or hackers or whatever, you would still have your independent uh, energy system. Mm -hmm. Moreover, installation of local solar systems can support local businesses. We do have several small solar businesses in the area that advertise regularly. That's local jobs and, and local economic support here. Mm -hmm. And robust rooftop installation reduces the land requirements for ground mounted solar, although both are going to be needed if we're going to meet the net zero uh, goals. And as you folks have just been discussing, uh, financial incentives are going to be needed. And in that context, the legislators 2022 climate plan does include financial incentives that I think that uh, we ought to investigate. I, it's my understanding that's that's something that's you know completely separate from the PACE program and would be available to um, individual homeowners, but I don't know really the details about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then to summarize the 2050 roadmap report, uh, there are various challenges. One is being the siting of the renewables, both wind and solar, due to our high population density and the expense of land. And siting the electrical transmission lines uh, is difficult for the same reasons. <laughs> wind, solar, and hydro generation are not located near the end users. And so that really is going to mean that you have to have uh, really an upgraded transmission grid. And that is part of the challenge for Massachusetts here. We've seen right here in Amherst, the, the tall poles or transmission lines that are being put in across the town. They're not exactly pretty, but they're uh, going to be necessary for this purpose. Then we, here in New England, we do have potential extreme weather events, and we don't know what the climate change is going to do that. And then both wind and solar, the peak loads are not in sync with the peak production. And so one is going to need to really upgrade the uh, storage facilities. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, 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 so I think I would like to just yes. continue if you don't mind, and then have the questions at the end, because I think the two are, are kind of linked here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So going on then to the clean energy and climate plan for 2025 and 2030. And so this plan now sets specific goals for our emission reductions for this next decade and describes the strategies to reach the goals for each sector. And in contrast to the 2020 roadmap, there's significantly more emphasis on the carbon sequestration and preserving the natural and working lands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking again at our greenhouse gas emissions with the transportation leading the way up here in the uh, about 40% and buildings being significant and then the electricity, uh, the em emissions have reduced, but we're going to be raising the amount of, elect of electricity. And so now I'm going to show you essentially the same data but plotted in a different way, which is why I showed this first here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so this is really the most important plot of the talk. Uh, it's from the climate plan here. And again, it shows uh, the, the emissions from the various sectors now starting in 1990, which is the reference year uh, and extended out and projected to 2030 with the diamonds being the goals here. So you can see that transportation is a very large uh, segment of this and buildings and that electricity, uh, the emissions have indeed uh, reduced over the years. So 2020, we had a certain goal and uh, you can see that uh, Massachusetts made the goal. But then if you look closely, you look and you see the big drop in the transportation sector in 2020. And I think that has a specific reason. I think it was a certain pandemic that did that, that suddenly you know, a lot of people weren't commuting into their offices and so on, and people were just kind of staying home and withdrawing from life. And that did decrease the amount of transportation significantly. And it was that decrease that made us able to reach the 2020 goal quite effectively. And so now the challenge comes in for these next 10 years. And so you see the projections are essentially to have the sectors being relatively flat for the next five years or three years now until 2025. But that is assuming that after the pandemic, people did not go back to their old driving habits, which I'm not sure that's a good assumption. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's the 2025, and then you look and you see that to get to the 2030 goal, which is a reduction of 50% overall compared to 1990, that requires a really steep drop, particularly in the transportation sector, but also in the building sector. Mm -hmm. And for the electricity, maybe you don't need as steep a drop in the overall emissions, but because you're increasing the amount of electricity, you still do need a significant drop in order to keep the percentage low. And so this is what I see as the biggest, biggest challenge. Um, and whether we can get there, I really just don't know. So here then summarize the goals. Uh, we met the goal for one reason or another. And then 2025 uh, is further reduction. And then 2030 is a really significant reduction that's needed here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then it, breaking it out into the sectors and how does this 2022 climate plan propose to get there? So transportation, you know, as you're talking about, need to reduce the growth of vehicle miles by improving public transportation. That means adding bus service and converting to electrical fleets. And along the lines of your discussion just today, I mean, I see that the bus service in here in Amherst uh, and the PVTA, we really need some analysis and improvement. I mean, you know, people have been talking for years and you have it in your CARP report that there's insufficient bus service, say from East Hadley Road and all the apartments building out there. Uh, there's no simple way to get to a grocery store. It takes hours and bus changes and so on. And that's really crazy and, and really should have been changed long ago. But that's the kind of thing that needs to be changed. And I really think that the whole bus service needs to be analyzed. Uh, you know, a little more publicity to get more UMass student drivers and uh, in, increase the bus service maybe a little bit later at night and, and really do a concerted effort to try to get people in Amherst uh, to, to see that, that bus service can be something reliable and convenient. Mm -hmm. And then the transition to electric vehicles, of course, that uh, which is dependent uh, to a large extent on, on individuals really to uh, whether they choose to buy a new vehicle and uh, if so, whether they feel that the, the price is right and 
so on. And then the state is pledging to improve the charging infrastructure. If you're going to have all electric vehicles, you certainly need to charge them if you drive the turnpike from west, west coast of Massachusetts to Boston. So that that is, is, is something that the uh, Massachusetts is going to be investing in. And the goals for the decrease in the of emissions in the transportation sector are really, really uh, significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in buildings, again, it's improving the energy efficiency uh, that's, that's clearly going to give you the most benefit, again, just as you've been talking about uh, this, this time, uh, enhancing the energy codes for new buildings, uh, and then getting really the financial incentives for, for heat pump installation, for, um, for solar panels on the roofs and so on. And I was thinking as you were discussing it to, today that, that really what's needed is to somehow make it easy for people. That means for the uh, developers, the contractors, you know, somehow make it easier for them to get the information they needed and to go through the permitting process, uh, trying to maybe look at look at our town processes and see if we can do more to get it all in one place or make it more one-stop shopping. And the same then for residences, uh, it, you know, it can be overwhelming if you, as an individual homeowner, have to try to talk with a number of different contractors, assess what the options are, try to learn what what reimbursements you could get and so on, and uh, anything that could be done to somehow centralize the uh, information somehow and, and make it more of a town service, again, uh, somehow a, a one stop where a homeowner could get the information. And it's my understanding again, that the uh, legislature's 2022 uh, law that they've passed will really uh, give some financial incentives and we really need to find out more about it for say from our elected representatives because the building <laughs> goal for 2030 really is a steep drop here. Mm -hmm. So electricity generation, uh, well, the demand is going to increase significantly if we electrify things. And so that means that the transmission and distribution systems across Massachusetts will really need upgrades and increased capacity. And, and that's going to be something that may have significant cost associated with it. Wind energy will be the dominant renewable and the, the Baker administration and the legislature, I've heard a couple of talks from representatives uh, about that. Uh, they're really enthused that this is a way to bring jobs to Massachusetts, help Massachusetts economy. And the goal is to make wind energy be at least 40% of our electricity generation by 2050. As, my understanding that there are at least two contracts that are now in operation and the work is underway. A third contract is uh, being negotiated, maybe close to being signed. There's future contracts. There's several large uh, experienced solar companies that are interested. I mean, I don't mean solar, I mean wind, wind energy companies. Uh, and uh, this would be mostly in the, the, the deep water south of Cape Cod. So that, that is ongoing and uh, everyone in the state seems to be enthused about that. Uh, then for solar, which is also an important contribution, there is new emphasis in this report on the rooftop solar, trying to get a, as much as possible there. And then the land conservation has new urgency here. So uh, just a statement from the report here that uh, the deployment of solar resources has two challenges, and one being the interconnection uh, of the distributed resources, as we've discussed, you know, if you're going to install a large scale um, solar, you need to get it properly hooked up to the ener energy grid, to the 
transmission lines and so on. Uh, you need to be considering what kind of battery storage you're going to have. And then the other being the impacts on the natural and working lands, which is really an emphasis of this clean energy and climate plan. So again, a further statement, quoting from the report here, uh, that DOR, DOER is going to be tasked then with working on this balance here, the balance of the two sides of the equation that you want to be uh, have incentives that promote solar, but at the same time, you need to have the balance and uh, Im improve the natural and working lands uh, for their goal of sequestration. <laughs> So, and, and note the wording down here that it says the built environments will include 2 million systems installed on rooftops, lawns, fields, parking lots, and so on. So we can ask, well, how many of those 2 million systems can we install here in Amherst to do our share? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so then again, quoting from the report here, of protecting our natural and working lands, that these provide uh, many uh, benefits here. That the clean energy plan recognizes the need for sequestering carbon. And modern climate models in the past few years clearly show that we're not going to be able to control the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere just by reducing, reducing emissions, that we really are going to have to increase the drawdown of CO2 from the atmosphere. And so that at the present time, we have no brilliant technology uh, to do that. Uh, the natural world is doing it. And so we really need to put an emphasis on preserving forests, particularly old growth forests, wetlands, and in general, uh, the natural world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's these statements uh, here and from the land sector report in 2050, they gave an estimate of how much uh, sequestration, the forests and wetlands and so on in Massachusetts are, are achieving each year. And that is apparently only about half of what will really be needed by 2050 to balance the equation of residual emissions versus uh, the drawdown. <laughs> so I have inserted here an interesting chart which shows the global amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere as measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. So I won't read this whole thing. Uh, here is the chart. So ever since 1957, uh, this, this one facility at about 11,000 feet on the slopes of Mauna Loa has been measuring the atmospheric carbon dioxide consistently the same way uh, hourly over the course of these 65 years. Uh, I can attest that this is a very high dry site because I spent many a night on the neighboring mountain at 14,000 feet at the astronomy observatory. And it, the humidity can be as low as like 10%. Uh, it's, it's a very clean place. This, and uh, on the slopes of Mauna Loa, there's no local vegetation. Uh, you really are sampling uh, the clean atmosphere and uh, at 20 degrees latitude, it's near uh, the uh, location where with the Hadley circulation, the, the air from the upper atmosphere is de descending. Um, so, but you see that the curve, the true measurements here with the red lines uh, oscillate a bit. And so let me show you the next plot, which is uh, an expanded just uh, the past six years or so. Um, of the, and what you're seeing in the red lines there is you are seeing the biosphere breathing for our planet. It's the seasonal variation that's due to photosynthesis. So the red curve there, it's the monthly means, but you see uh, in the Northern hemisphere, um, by the end of summer, the Northern hemisphere, uh, the amount of CO2 decreases somewhat 
because the the all of the photosynthesis has pulled it down and then the cold winter um, rises again. And so you see this cycle. And in fact, the uh, nat natural biosphere pulls down about 30% of the human generated carbon dioxide annually. And so it really is significant and something that that we really, you know, have to preserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, back to Massachusetts here. Uh, here is a uh, map from the report of the land use in Massachusetts. The red is the settled built up areas. That's about 25% of the state land. As you can see, it's uh, most of Eastern Massachusetts plus the Springfield area out here <laughs> and the green then is the forested land, which is about 57% of our state. And as, uh, it's mainly here in Western Massachusetts. And one thing that surprised me was that the cropland in yellow is only about 7% of Massachusetts. I thought it was really significantly higher. I mean, I go to the store and buy local milk without thinking twice about it. I really thought that there was more farmland in Massachusetts, but it's concentrated right around here, which means uh, in my view that we really do have an obligation to take that seriously and try our best to preserve the uh, cropland right in our area for the, for the good of the whole community. Mm -hmm. So again, just summarizing the, the numbers here, 25% of the area is built up, the forest is more than half, and the rest is just uh, a small amount. And so according to our town's master plan, uh, the protected agricultural land in Amherst makes out of, up about 18% of our area. <laughs> so then again, quoting from the report, a uh, statement on the forests, recognizing their, their importance for sequestration, but also for all of the other reasons uh, for um, protecting the, the watersheds, uh, for um, sustainable timber products and uh, wildlife habitat, uh, uh, helping to clean the air and water, recreation and so on, so that there are many reasons for doing our best to preserve our forests here. Mm -hmm. And the state then has uh, committed to increasing uh, the permanent conservation on its land uh, by another couple of percentages by uh, 2025 and 2030. And a note that here in Amherst, about 30% of our land is permanently protected. A lot of that is uh, down in, in South Amherst, the Lawrence Swamp area, which has several of our town water wells. Um, that's a large area. And then some other areas uh, scattered around the town too. So the, the report uh, puts in some additional goals of wanting to incentivize uh, privately owned forests and farms and incentivize usually means provide money. So uh, I think that would be again, worth investigating here, planting trees. And that's something that we can do uh, right here in Amherst too, uh, maybe part of the new Hickory Ridge or part of some of the other areas around town. And then, uh, the state wants to be uh, committed to achieving no net loss of stored carbon in, in wetlands and then uh, natural working lands overall. Mm -hmm. So environmental justice then is included too, uh, having an awareness of that and where you, you site any industrial scale facilities uh, in any residential area or something. And also in, in where you plant trees in town, you know, can we make an effort to, to um, help plant trees near around some of the uh, rental areas in Amherst that help make a uh, 
create shade, help make a pleasanter environment, and so on. And then, as you've alluded to uh, already today, there's the challenge of the high upfront costs of the new technologies of, you know, renovating residences and apartment buildings and so on. And so there's a challenge of how do you get the, the benefits of the solar photovoltaics and heat pumps for renters, how do you, and the 2022 legislative uh, bill that's been passed does include language uh, for how to uh, help make the utility bills actually for the renters reflect then any increased uh, benefits from energy efficiency in the buildings where they live. And again, I think that this that whole area is something that our town really needs to pursue. We really need to find out, you know, what are the possibilities for funding and try to get all that information in one place. And then as you folks are talking about doing some kind of education campaign and, and helping to uh, make all that possible. Mm -hmm. So finally then, my takeaways for Amherst, uh, we've said energy efficiency is the most cost-effective thing to do, particularly for the near term. And um, to do that, I think we need, really need to investigate what are the financial in, incentives and, and how do we get access to this. Uh, the electricity demand will rise gradually as other sectors become more electrified. And wind energy will become the largest source of renewable energy in Massachusetts. As I say, the governor and legislature's goal is 40% of electricity generation. So one could ask, what is Amherst's share of that? You know, if we are taxpayers and uh, we pay our utility bills, both of which are helping to finance this wind development, shouldn't we be able to count some of the wind energy then uh, when we do our balance sheet about what is Amherst's um, uh, energy consumption and so on. Uh, and then maximizing the rooftop solar is very important in order to save natural and working lands. Both may be needed, but the more you can do in the built environment, uh, the better. And this is something that I think Amherst really needs to uh, get busy in working on. Uh, Massachusetts, UMass is, is sort of leading the way to some extent. Uh, maybe we can have more collaboration there, uh, you know, uh, put projects together to try to make uh, some savings. Uh, now, I think there's opportunities here. And then finally, that uh, the natural and working lands are important for sequestration. And the land sector report from uh, two years ago uh, showed that the amount of carbon sequestration in the undisturbed soils is really significant and could even be as much as half of the carbon sequestration, say, in a forested area. And so that, again, we need to be careful and assess the quality of our soils in any places that are going to be disturbed. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess then I will uh, stop here and stop my share and hopefully can get to questions. Yeah, first off, Martha, thank you so much for your time. Um, okay. This is great. I really appreciate, uh, you know, sharing this uh, information on the 2050 plan in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's open up to the public for comments and then to the panels. Yeah, I would like to know um, how many uh, people are actually listening. Uh, there are 19 attendees at the most attended. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, Vasu, I, I, do you want me to um, unmute? Yes, please. Acknowledge folks as they raise their hands. So uh, the first person is Elisa. And Elisa, I will unmute you and you can go ahead and speak. Martha, that was excellent. I learned a lot. Uh -huh. I have a 
kind of a package of comments or questions, one of which is that it seems to me that the looking at things town by town makes no sense. I realize this is a town committee, but a forest destroyed in Maine, just as bad as a forest destroyed in Massachusetts. And in that context, I think Hydro-Quebec is an abomination. That's just a statement. But anyway, in terms of our, our local situation, it seems to me as a person who lives in a condo, who at least so far has never had an opportunity to participate in mass save, that the financial benefits of all the programs so far have gone to people who could afford to live in single family houses. And while I am glad to have solar collectors behind the meter, because it benefits all of us indirectly, all the financial benefits have gone to the homeowners. I still pay the same electric bill, which contributes to the subsidy that helped put those collectors on the roofs. So I applaud your comment at the end and everybody else on the committee who has brought up the issue of you know, social justice, et cetera. We need to find ways to make the benefits apply to people who can't afford to own a home, whether they're renters or condo. Half our housing in Amherst is multifamily housing between mm -hmm. mostly apartments and some condos. Anyway, but I really appreciate all the information and I think it's great, <laughs> but I think we have a lot of difficult issues to deal with as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. Definitely something to be conscious about. Thank you. Eric Bachrock, you're next to have unmuted you. You can speak. Eric, you have to unmute yourself. You can go ahead. Thank you so much for um, Martha. That was a, just a spectacular synthesis of the newest information that is coming out um, uh, regarding um, um, uh, kind of our our climate our pending climate catastrophe and how we can begin to avert it. Um, I um, I wanted to just refer for a second to my, uh, Elisa's comment just now about um, that. The, the, I, I have always felt that the, if it's a state promulgation that we have to um, reduce our um, reliance on fossil fuel, it's really a statewide problem and to see to, a, a statewide challenge. And if we could see that really as a statewide challenge and not simply a town or a village um, issue that if we look at it look at it from a much more regional perspective. So I've I've I really felt that um, we we really need to kind of expand our our, our focus um, in support of what you um, indicated regarding distributed solar, in particular rooftop solar. I'm I've kind of um, I chuckled uh, because um, how how sl how slowly information uh, forgive the expression percolates or trickles down uh, the in in support of um, the need for a distributed and an extensive distributed and rooftop solar um, a deployment in Massachusetts there was a report um, by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory laboratory dated January 2016 called rooftop solar photovoltaic technical potential in the United States, a detailed assessment. And if one were to look at the um, potential um, uh, for Massachusetts to offset its total consumption, Massachusetts is the seventh highest state where at, if, if fully deployed on rooftop rooftops, Massive, the state itself can de, de, um, could um, uh, um, defray up to 47% of its electrical needs simply by distributing solar on rooftops. So I would, and that was 2016, that was over um, six years ago. So I was gratified to see the state coming around 
um, emphasizing the importance of distributed solar because it's clear that um, the, the, the more that we have it on rooftops, parking lot canopies, um, et cetera, um, um, commercial, industrial, and small buildings, large buildings, medium-sized buildings, the better off we would be. So I was delighted to see that in your report. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Eric. Looks like we do not have any other, oh, there's nope, one. There are. Um, Lenore, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your good work and this educational series. I'm looking forward to um, tuning in for more. And when um, Don and all of you were giving your presentations, I think not only is it great for you to be hosting this educational series for people to come to you to ECAC and learn more, but maybe you can have a, an educational series that you are you're peddling sort of you know, in, in uh, for the PACE program, you're peddling that to the developers and landowners and probably, anyway, just a thought that that is not actually what I want to say uh, primarily, but, but that was something I was thinking. This educational series can really go in many directions. Um, and Martha, thank you so much for um, summarizing that uh, those those climate model plans and reports for us. I want to just highlight a couple of things that I know about from working with the state um, a bit on on these climate um, issues. Is these are goals, and the goals are not what are the current practices. It's just kind of important to remember that um, that it sounds really good on paper, but that is not what the state is doing right now. Um, and I also want to highlight a couple of people have talked about this regional perspective. And when you were showing the map that Western Mass um, contains most of the forest land and farmlands. So if you think about that as an organism, if the, if, if the state of Massachusetts was a, was a human body, then Western Mass would be like where the lungs and the liver, you know, where those organs are. And we don't want to sacrifice those organs because the system has this idea to expend less energy, which is maybe done by other parts of the organism. So I'm proposing that we consider um, that our fair share could be really protecting our green lands because that's what we have to offer to the region um, as a whole. That's the best thing. That's the biggest resource that we have. And I also want to highlight that undisturbed soil um, sequesters perhaps 50%. And not only is that the function of undisturbed soil, but when you destroy the underground mycorrhizal fungal networks in forests, for instance, not only are you destroying the entire neurobiological, sociobiological community that is a forest that they've invested years in developing, but any logging, any developing, because of that disturbance of the soil reduces the capacity of photosynthesis. So all of these models, um, it, we have to take into consideration what we're actually doing on our land. Working lands do not do it as best as undisturbed lands. That's something, even though we, of course, we need working lands, but that's something else to understand. And the state has not protected its state forested lands. They're logged. They're, the legislation we tried to pass has not passed. Um, and now we're trying to work with Dewar to see if from a regulatory capacity that can be changed. Because finally, after a few decades, there's an understanding of, as you said, Martha, the brilliant technology is in the natural world of that biosphere. And we're understanding more and more of that. That's why the later climate models for 2025 and 2050 are very different than the ones from 2020, because they're finally listening to those, those climate scientists, right? The climate movement has been very focused on energy renewables. Hey, hey Lenore, so, sorry to cut you short, but I want to be yeah. mindful of everybody's no, time. That's okay. We have five more minutes and there are seven hands raised. So yeah, appreciate yeah. I will your just stop thought. right Thank here. You.
I will just stop right here. And, and, and I will, you know, it, it would be great if we could have another educational series where we talk about these topics particularly. I think that would be a really good um, uh, learning for ECAC and for all of us. Thank you so Thank you, much Vicky. for your good work. Thank you. And if everybody could take about uh, 45 seconds, please. <laughs> um, just want to make sure we wrap this up on time. Um, Janet McGowan, I'm unmuting you. So if you unmute yourself as well, you can speak. Thank you. And thank you for your work on ECAC. I know how important this is. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure Martha can answer it because it was a question I had when I was reading the climate action plan for the state. Um, so UMass and Amherst College have decided that the way they're going to get to net zero is through geothermal, largely, not completely, but largely. And so that since they use about half of the energy in Amherst, I thought, well, that's great news, right? And so, you know, if we're trying to get to zero, you know, the, these this is one way we're getting to it. And it seems like a simple way. Um, Carleton College has already reduced half of its carbon dioxide emissions through geothermal. They replaced a plant and they have, um, I think they have one or two wind turbines. I, I can't remember, you know, my son went to Carleton, so I was kind of paying attention to that. And so I also have a friend who has one of those giant houses that you look at and you kind of judge and you think, oh my God, those people are using so much energy. And in fact, they're on geothermal, you know, for the last 20 years plus solar panels. And so my question for the action plan, it, directing to Martha, is where is it in the act? Where is this geothermal thing? Because this the city of Utica is, you know, using geothermal for its whole downtown. It's it's you know town buildings and it's you know their um, downtown buildings are going to put in a plant and do that. And it just seems to me that that has to be part of the mix because for a large, you know, concentrated institutions or areas. You know, what could be better than just getting some heat from the ground? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, as far as I know, it just wasn't in these two reports that it's it's one of those technologies that's now developing. And hopefully no, you could, Steve you has something to say. Yeah. Yes, you could hopefully that your committee can could follow up. Yeah. St Steve. Janet, you're mistaken geothermal. Uh, that's commonly used out here, which is geothermal heat pumps, which use electricity and they move heat to and from the ground or from the air. That's not getting heat from the ground to generate electricity. So geothermal is not an energy source. The geothermal heat pumps are in the plan and that comes under the building efficiency. So that's a major, major component as we move buildings off of heating oil or natural gas, we're putting them into um, using heat pumps, air sourced or ground source heat pumps, and then using electricity. So that's a big reason why as we decrease fossil fuel use, our electricity use is going to double in the next, uh, well, by 2050. So it's not, a, it's not an energy source, it's an efficiency uh, tool. Geothermal is also called, you said it, ground source heat pump. Right. So that's why there's a confusion of language there, but that's what they mean yeah. when they say geothermal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was I was confused uh, uh, too by that. I mean, the real geothermal was like what they tried to do in Hawaii, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, there are uh, geothermal plants. California has some. Iceland's got a bunch, but we just don't have the heat close to the surface of the ground. Uh -huh. to, to, uh -huh. to do that. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, jump to our next question. Uh, Ju Julian Hines, I've allowed you to talk. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, if you can wrap it up in uh, one minute, please. Yep, you got it. Thank you so much, everyone. And I appreciate you holding this forum. I just had a quick question, which is, how is community solar being encouraged where it would give ratepayers a break on their electricity, increasing the environmental justice aspect, but also would prevent the chopping of trees for private type solar projects? Um, where is that sort of in this? I appreciate everyone's time today and I will try to wrap it up right now. Thanks, Julian. Does anyone have that answer for Julian? Uh, Dwayne? Yeah, I'm happy to, to uh, um, address that, at least to start addressing that in the limited time. I mean, the, 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 the state solar program has incentives for um, what's called community shared solar. Uh, that doesn't that that includes and primarily most of the community shared solar 
projects around Massachusetts are still pretty large scale. Uh, and some of them are going, um, some of them are on buildings, some of them are on landfills, some of them are on the built environment, but some of them are also the projects that we see that are going on um, um, uh, the natural, uh, natural world. Um, and so, um, but they are projects that do offer benefits directly to um, uh, uh, rate payers in the form of uh, net metering discount rates, uh, essentially. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. We're past time. Um, here's a recommendation. It's great that more people have questions. There's we, either we can all stay for a couple of minutes to finish the questions, or yeah. we can have people um, write to us and we will respond. Uh, either I don't know, Stephanie, if that works, or if we come back in two weeks and you can pose your questions. Um, Stephanie, what do you recommend? Um, well, if you're all willing, I think you only have two more uh, public attendees who have their hands raised. Actually, and one person's put their hand down. So there's only <laughs> okay. one at this point. So I would say probably if you're willing to put in another sure. 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so Thanks, Kathleen Bridgewater, I've allowed you to talk so you can just unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to say thank you. This has been very enlightening. I hope that um, ECAC, which has this wonderful uh, desire to be educating the community, will take uh, the presentation that Martha made and put it in some really prominent place on the town website so that somebody showing up at the front page of the town website can see something as enlightening as this amazing presentation was. And that's all I have to say, and except for thank you. Excellent suggestion, thank you. And then we have three panelists who have questions. So Steve, Laura, and Jesse. Great, thank you. I have a couple of notes here, um, yeah. responding to a couple of comments. Elisa, the, the Mass Save program does have programs specific to renters and condo owners. Um, renters can call up Mass Save and they will come and do an assessment of your apartment. I'm pretty sure they have something for condo owners. So take a look at that, anybody who's a renter or a condo owner. And then a comment to Eric Backrack. Um, you mentioned the NREL report. Yeah, Massachusetts, that, that report shows that the technical potential for Massachusetts is 47% of the year 2013 electricity sales. So while that sounds good, remember electricity is going to more than our consumption of electricity is going to more than double by the year 2050. So we're looking at a technical potential of perhaps 25 percent. And at least in other states where they've looked at the, the difference between the technical potential and the economic potential, the actual economic potential is maybe a half or a third or even smaller of the technical potential. So solar is there's definitely potential on rooftops. It's just from whatever everything I've read, it's, it's not as great as we would like it to be. And with that, Martha, the um, you really emphasized the the state looking at the natural working lands, which I agree that was really emphasized in the latest CECP report. Do you get the sense that the state may be backing away from what it uh, the solar goals that it had presented earlier, which was like sixty thousand acres of solar in addition to maximizing rooftops and parking lots and such? Um, you know, I. I was looking for that 60,000 and I didn't see it. And I didn't, you know, I, so I, I, I did not see really a statement in the latest report of some, you know, real number, we're going to have this many rooftops and this much solar, it just, or, you know, so on. It just was, was, was kind of trying to shift the emphasis. And so, um, I, I don't I don't know uh, what we can do. I think we're waiting now to to for the solar assessment here in Amherst uh, to see how much we have in the way of you know open lands or, or what. I mean, a lot of Amherst open land is already preserved or is working farmlands and so on. Um, so I don't know. I. Sure, looking around at a lot of 
roofs with nice sloping south-facing roofs and saying, well, why don't they have their solar panels up? Uh, and I don't know, we don't have too many parking lots, but hopefully we can uh, get get busy on them. And, and Steve, uh, you should be justifiably proud of what Hampshire has done. Uh, what is your total acreage of solar panels? We've got just under 20 acres, so 4.6 megawatts. Yeah, and uh, can you tell me how on the on the Bay Road part, how what the size of that one is? Yeah, that's each of them. Yeah, that's uh, Bay Road there near Atkins Market. That's um, about ten acres. Ten acres, okay, because that's something everybody sees, so that's a good right. kind of marker. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to lead tours if anybody wants to ah, take a, okay. a close up look at that. I'm happy um, we can yeah. get inside the fence and take a look at the grounds there. Mm -hmm. Laura. Thanks, Vasu, and thanks, Martha, for um, the great presentation. I had a similar sort of question or comment as, as Steve around sort of the amount of solar that the state is expecting us to have to put on land. So I think that's something, a good follow-up to figure out if that number is still the same or if it's changed at all. But you did say early on, Martha, that we we will still need to put some solar on land. And I think that point may have gotten sort of a bit buried, um, but I think it's an important point to raise. Um, while I agree with the commenter that it would be wonderful for Amherst to, and Western Mass in general, to be the lungs of the state, if we have to put solar on some land, basically what we're saying, if we take that claim, is that other parts of Massachusetts need to get rid of some of their land. And from an environmental justice perspective, I think we just really need to think about that. What, what are we saying? We're saying that other communities may need to put solar on land while, while we may, may be less willing to do so. So I just think we really need to keep that framing in mind when we're thinking about our next steps. I would also say that, you know, relying on I think I'm super excited about the offshore wind industry. I think this is a huge boost for Massachusetts in terms of job creation um, and reaching our climate goals. Um, that also is gonna require people to support offshore wind and we have a history of not doing that. So I think similarly with Hydro-Quebec, our plan does rely on significant input from Hydro-Quebec, which if right now is in major limbo. So I think we have to keep in mind that everybody is gonna to have to do some sacrificing to meet our climate goals. Um, the final point I just wanna make is, is that Martha, you said, you said in passing old growth forests, and I think it's just extremely important to be clear that all old growth forests in Massachusetts, of which there's very, very little, is permanently in conservation. So no solar is going to be going on old growth forests. So I just don't want us to be spreading that misinformation. Thank you. Yeah. But I, th I think any, you know, the technical report that I report on from 2020 was the, you know, the, the most fundamental analysis. I mean, they admitted right there that even if you put in the best possible data and your best possible modeling, you still have assumptions and projections. And so I think it's, I really question taking literally a certain number of, of acres and saying, oh, this is what's needed is, you know, X acres of solar or X uh, gigawatts of wind or, or something, because we just don't, you know, know it that much. We have to proceed gradually. Uh, the electricity demand is going to go up gradually depending on, you know, the other sectors and what goes on. So I'm just waiting for you know, technology to catch up here with improved battery storage. As I say, you know, I want solar panels on top of every car and truck. And, uh, you know, I think there's some other potentials to get there if we really start pushing on the technology. Okay, so thank you all. Jesse, go ahead and then Stephanie. Um, First of all, thank, I just want to thank also the, the, the attendees and the public. This has been a hugely engaged meeting. And thank you, Vasu, for making that happen. Thank you all so much. I have a very, I think, I don't know if you have the answer to this, Mark. That's a sort of technical question. From early in the presentation, the natural gas 
or the, the electricity emissions going down because of the shift from coal to natural gas. Can you yeah. confirm if that, or do you know whether that includes fugitive emissions? Um, and maybe Dwayne or Steve, you might know as well. So is that just direct emissions or the entire natural gas? Um, I think it's just the direct. I mean, they do mention in the, in the category of other, which is about 10%, the sort of the, the the fugitive emissions or the the, the gas leaks, the you know uncontrolled um, problems and so on that that you know that ought to be addressed. But uh, yeah, I just want to, yeah, I think it's yeah. important if if yeah. if what they're calling natural gas, which maybe we call toxic combustible fuel instead. Yes, yes exactly. Um, if, if, is if a, that's part of what's yeah. driving that number down, let's make sure. I think it's important to realize it may not be true, and which brings back, I think, just that that bullet point of efficiency, load reduction, huge. And Martha, again, thank you so much. This was really great. Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's a good point, though, uh, that when you see that lovely plot of the uh, emissions going down for, for electricity, electricity sector that it really is not including you know the leaks and the losses and that kind of thing that that needs to get fixed Stephanie yeah. it's the wonders of fracking so I just wanted to make a point that um while Hampshire College is being lauded for their solar installation, I would like to note that the town has a project that has gone online recently. It's 15 acres. It's nearly four megawatts on the north landfill. And so the town is trying to do its part, although we don't own that system itself. We have certainly contributed that amount of solar to the state's portfolio, renewable portfolio. So I do want to like, you know, give our town some credit because that was a long, hard yeah. fought battle. Yeah. And we got to give you the credit because you've been working on that for yes, yes, 20 yes. years. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Nearly a decade for sure. I'd, I'd really love to hear more uh, one of our future updates, uh, Stephanie, on that on that mm -hmm. project. Dwayne? Mm -hmm. Yep, sorry. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. And, and let me first uh, thank Martha. Um, uh, I, I got to know Mar Martha in the uh, solar uh, bylaw working group uh, and she uh, volunteered to do this research and, and present to the working group this uh, the the carbonization decarbonization plan and uh, I, I, and and she honed it even more for for this presentation so uh, really thank thank you uh, Martha for that um, and and likewise the, the participants uh, the public I just wanted to mention maybe one more thing that's maybe important for us and, and the participants to recognize also in this plan is that it's not really and and, and it's sort of embedded in this in the in the uh, plan and the strategies as well is that we can't really it's not really a matter of picking do we want offshore wind or solar or large-scale hydro or batteries it's really the the combination of, of the four of them all together yeah. uh, bringing different attributes associated with what the electricity grid needs to be reliable and, and reasonably cost effective um, and um, you know solar is is uh, very predictable uh, but more dominant uh, predictable that it's not going to be there at night for example uh, but also uh, quite predictable that it's going to be more prevalent in the summertime than the winter um, and uh, and likewise offshore wind has a um, counter uh, counter issue of being a bit more pr prevalent in the winter time uh, the large-scale hydro uh, for the, um, despite uh, some environmental trade-offs uh, associated with that, uh, is a really critical resource because uh, it's large, but also it can be ramped up and down extremely quickly, uh, which is uh, really critical for this grid to work with the intermittency of solar and, and wind, uh, despite all the predictability that it, that it does, does have now. Uh, and then lastly, battery storage, as uh, Martha mentioned, uh, to really make the um, make this uh, grid reliable uh, for us all. Uh, so I just thought I wanted to tie tie those that that part um, together. Jesse, final say. And Dwayne, not as a contradiction, but as a compliment to those four technological solutions, binding all that together, a cultural shift and a mindset shift and a sense of compromise and teamwork 
and hard work, um, all of which is not technological, but political, cultural, et cetera, to really allow these things to happen. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. All, all right. right. I compliment your committee. I think you're, you know, you're really digging into this in a, in a good way. Vasu, you're, you're yeah, doing a great job here. And, uh, you're cracking the whip on everyone, I think, and uh, I think people are responding. So uh, that's that's great. So, right. I, I'm I'm doing it in a nice way, not not with the whip, but uh, okay. um, but uh, you know, again, for everybody you know who's attending this for the first time, thank you for joining. Thank you for sticking around for two hours and fifteen minutes. Uh, we meet every two weeks. So I urge you all to join. I'll also talk to your friends and relatives uh, about this. Uh, the usual meetings are only an hour long from 4.30 to 5.30. It's only when we have the education series, it extends to two hours. So we will try to wrap things up uh, within an hour. And if you have something that you want to learn about, um, uh, let me know or let Stephanie know. Please shoot us a note, email, whatever works. Um, with that, I'm going to close. So thank you all for joining. And thank you, Martha, once again, for your right. um, awesome thank presentation. You, okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.